Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon. My name is Sarah Coffey. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist at Oklahoma State University. Um, I'm a member of the Medical Directors Institute here at National Council, and I'm happy to be here with you today to present on some of our work um, related to mass violence. And at my right here is Dr. Frank Shelf, and I'll let him introduce himself as well. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I am currently a medical director for Centene Corporation, which is the largest Medicaid managed care company uh, in the United States. I'm formerly the inaugural commissioner of Georgia's Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, um, where I was at between 2009 and 2012. I've been part of the Medical Director Institute here at National Council from the beginning, as I think Sarah has. Uh, and so we're excited to be with you this afternoon and give you a, a bit of a teaser about a, our latest paper, our latest monograph on uh, mental illness and violence. So we're not going to cover the whole paper. Uh, we're going to talk really primarily about two sections of it and hopefully just uh, generate some of your interest so that you'll want to read the whole thing when it comes out, uh, probably in the next couple of months. So with that, Sarah, take it away. I'll, I'll take it away. Um, so again, thank you guys for being here. As Frank mentioned, um, we're both members of the Medical Directors Institute for the National Council. Um, it's been uh, an organization that's existed for the past few years. Uh, and part of our work has been um, kind of at the behest of the National Council, uh, developing some white papers, coming together as kind of an expert group uh, to talk about really important issues that face our communities um, and that kind of correlate with the work that we do with mental health. Uh, the first paper that we did on a couple of years ago was about the psychiatric shortage, um, and hopefully uh, several of you have had the opportunity to take a look at that. Um, last year we talked about medication adherence, um, and then this past iteration, um, certainly I'm sure we're not alone with the kind of um, the necessity to talk about mass violence in America. Um, it's something that uh, it's hard to get away from, uh, and so certainly um, quite often whenever uh, a tragic event that mass violence occurs in America, um, there's a couple of options that come to the forefront as far as what we can do as a society to prevent this, um, right? And we're quite often talking about guns and mental health. Um, so the National Council wanted to bring us together to talk about this as kind of an expert group uh, about what we can do and what we know. Um, so I put this slide up here to kind of organize ourselves to the understanding that really regardless of what state you practice in, regardless of where you are, um, more than likely you've been affected in some way by one of these tragic events. Um, and earlier today, um, two clinicians that were involved in these events in their community had the chance to discuss um, some of the community's response. Um, but as you can see here in this map of the United States that these casualties have occurred kind of across our nation. Um, and certainly the fact that they've occurred um, has been isolated incidents, but with the 24-hour news cycle, um, it's something that's constantly on our mind as clinicians, as community members, as parents. Um, and so we wanted to make sure to kind of do diligence and talk about this in a framework to support the community um, for prevention as well as support. It's challenging though, and this is one thing that we should know, is that in spite of how the media talks about these tragic events, um, quite frankly, the, the in, the sample size, how often these are happening is still very small. And so whenever we are taking a look at the research and kind of understanding what leads to um, a perpetrator of mass violence perpetrating and committing these tragic events, um, it's very hard to understand this. And this slide up here shows you a bit of the other complexities with it. So whenever researchers, policy experts, individuals come together to really understand mass violence, it can be challenging because the way that we describe a mass violent event is often variable. And you can see here that depending on um, what report we're looking at, the FBI in 2008 described mass murder um, as, a, as a individual, a, an individual killer that's, done, that's killed four or more people in a single incident. Um, but more recently, recently, they shift the fatality criteria to be three or more. Um, so even there within the FBI's own definition, we've seen some changes in how we're defining mass violence. Um, going further in the Congressional Research Services report, um, again, they talk about motivational criteria and that the violence of these cases is not a means to an end. The gunmen do not pursue criminal profit or kill in the name of terrorist ideologies, for example. And even more so, the Stanford Mass Shootings of America just talks about no, that there's no fatality threshold. 
that there might be something to say as an individual um, has these kind of mass casualty events that perhaps um, if it's just the intent to do harm, that that might need to be in the, di in the criteria. So again, as we come together to really understand what it means to kind of lead to a mass violent event, it can be really challenging. Because as I talked about quite often, although it does feel like these are happening more frequently, um, really the fact of the matter is, is that they're, they're not happening as frequently for us to have a good understanding as to why. So we came together to discuss that a bit. So when we're looking about this, it's important to know, um, and this is a couple of examples, that depending on how you define how many deaths annually are occurring in a mass violence, um, like tragic situation, that there's a range. And so kind of more conservative estimates might put as many as 30 incidents of mass shooting deaths and injuries um, if you look at the FBI data and how they classify mass violence. But in kind of broader data and kind of the gun violence of America data, as many as 347 incidents of mass violence occurred in the year 2017. However, even within that broad swath of understanding casualties, it's important to note that firearm homicides that were not due to mass violence were up to 14,415. Even more so for all homicides, not including fire or including firearms, 16,000. Suicides, as we know here in the mental health community, even more so concerns with 21,000 individuals dying by suicide. And drug overdose, 72,000. If we look at medical errors, 250,000 of our community members have died due to medical errors. And that's not to say that we shouldn't focus on these casualties of mass violence. Um, I would add that in addition to the fatalities and for the families that have incurred this tragic event, as a community, it's still very distressing. For our children, it's very distressing too. But just to also put it into context, whenever we're looking at kind of causative factors of suicide, um, we have quite a bit of data, right? We know about the concerns for depression. We know about preventative efforts that we can take. But when it comes to really understanding mass violence here in America, um, it can be quite challenging. And that's something that as the kind of consensus of the group that came together, one thing that we recognize too. And perhaps a little pause to let you guys know about who that expert group consi um, consisted of. Um, there were several psychiatrists that were on the panel, uh, myself and Dr. Shelf and Dr. Roselle, who's down here as well. We had experts um, from judicial experts as well as law enforcement. Um, we have journalists that were on the panel as well, as well as um, family members um, and advocates for family members. And I think this is important too, and as we'll talk about, is that although quite often whenever a mass casualty incident will occur, it's often laid in the lap of mental health professionals, right? What can we do to prevent this from happening? But I think the kind of consensus of the expert panel is that we alone cannot be the ones that are kind of charged with changing that, that it really takes a kind of multidisciplinary effort to ensure preventative natures with mass casualties. However, it is important to note, and as we talked about, that although the N is still very small, that, quite, um, that really we're quite safe from having these incidents occur in our life, um, it is important to know that the frequency of which these mass casualty events are happening is becoming more frequent. And so since 2011, um, kind of the time in between mass casualty events has actually increased to 60, every 64 days. Um, and I don't know about you, but certainly for me, someone that watches this on the news, um, that takes care of individuals, that has families, that goes to schools and are in public areas all the time, um, when I hear about this on the news, um, it's distressing. And I'm sure I'm not alone in that. And it is important to know that the frequency is increasing. It's also important to know, too, that in addition to the increasing of frequency, what we're also seeing is an increase in casualties. And this is something that is, again, important for us to understand in the way that it impacts our community and why the National Council and certainly the MDI really wanted to discuss this as kind of a, as a team to come together. Because these events are happening more frequently, and when they do happen, they're actually costing more lives. And this is data that's currently out there right now to look at. What we also know, too, is that the United States is in kind of a particular um, frame of the world in how we're looking at mass violence. Um, and this is a graph that shows you a bit on the bottom. It's the guns per 100 people. Um, the y-axis is the mass shooters per 100 million people. Um, we know that in the United States, um, where um, gun rights is our right, um, that there are more homes that have access to weapons. Um, we also know that if you look at this kind of correlation, that there are more mass shooters per 100 million people. And we're certainly an outlier compared to other um, countries. So it is something that we're talking about. 
Um, this paper is entitled Mass Violence in America, um, but quite frankly, most of the violence that does occur does come from guns. And so that's why a lot of our conversations will focus on gun control and kind of the evidence and perhaps the not so evidence um, to support which way to go um, with preventing these types of casualties. So in summary, um, as we came together to kind of look at the existing research that's already there, um, what we do know, as stated, is that unfortunately, um, mass violence events are increasing in number. They're increasing in frequency, and they're increasing in severity. And as we talked about, um, they're also increasing in the media coverage. So it's something that, regardless of where you are, it's very hard to get away from. The minority view is that perhaps these aren't increasing as much as we think they are, and we'll talk a little bit about that and what that means. So, as I mentioned, oftentimes whenever these events occur, it's often put in the camp of more gun control, um, more access to mental health services. And it's important for us as mental health experts to take a look at this. Um, so this comes from a study that was done by Swanson about the kind of causation between serious mental illness contributing to overall violence towards others. It's important to know that this study was not done on mass violence, but more so violence in general. But in looking at this, as you can see, that the population attributable risk of serious mental illness contributing to violence in the community is only 4%. So a very small proportion of what violent incidents occurs can actually be attributed to severe and persistent mental illness. This is important for us to know as mental health experts, right? Because whenever the media comes out there, whenever people say that we should just lock everybody up and this is a really big problem, we know that that's not true. We know that it's more complicated than that and we know that we have to be advocates for our community to be able to support them. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm pushing buttons really excitedly as I talk to you guys about this. What we do know is that um, substance abuse certainly does play a role, but more so, up to 62% um, causes other factors that contribute to violence. Being young and male, living in poverty, child maltreatment, exposure to violence, or impulsive anger. That's not to say that as um, an expert consensus that we would say that individuals that perpetrate mass violence are emotionally well, but it is important to talk about this in the context of what are the attributable risks to leading to mass violence. That being said, as I mentioned, the way that we describe mass violence, how many um, casualties occurred, what was the motivation, how we describe mental illness is also very challenging too. And so in a study that was looking at 34 young males who killed at least three people in a single event, um, which more than likely would be con considered a mass casualty event, only one in four had a documented psychiatric history. So you can see here on the bottom that about 23% actually had a psychiatric history, whether that be um, a, a diagnosis of schizophrenia, a major depressive disorder, what have you. Um, only 6% of them were psychotic at the time of incident. And this is something that was really important for our expert panel to discuss as well. Just because you have a diagnosable psychiatric illness, that does not necessarily mean that that illness contributed to you with the behavior that um, led to a mass violent event. And so it's important for us to talk about this as well. That being said, as we kind of dived into other aspects of the research, again, depending on how you are defining mental illness, was this a diagnosable mental illness um, with the DSM-5? Um, was this considered just a mental health stressor? Um, it's kind of all over the board. And you can see from a researcher's perspective to understand kind of the causality, what is causing leading up into these um, events um, and how we prevent this from happening, it can be very challenging whenever you have this wide variety um, presented in the research. So NICS data will say that 4.7% um, had a diagnosis of mental illness, 11% um, evidence of poor mental health concerns, right? So perhaps not a diagnosis of mental illness, but perhaps some difficulty with anger, um, some difficulty with impulsivity. Um, and Silver's um, article in 2018, Mental Health Stressor, um, relates some issues with anxiety or perhaps depression, but not necessarily a diagnosable mental illness. Again, this can be very challenging for researchers and for those of us that are looking at the data to inform best practices. And we put this up here just to kind of let you guys know about some of the challenges. Um, and whenever the paper comes out in April, we'll propose some of the solutions to kind of look towards um, a more rich database. 
Again, another way to look at this high likelihood of one or more range of diagnosable behavioral disorders um, is important because we know that the majority of, not the majority, but a large percentage of Americans here in the United States will have a diagnosable mental illness. Um, so as a woman, I think I can say this, um, but also knowing that Frank is my male counterpart here, um, we know that um, a large majority of individuals that perpetuate mass violence are male. But that is not to say that being male is necessarily a risk factor for mass violence. Does that make sense? And so it's important for us to understand this whenever we're talking about mental health as a causative agent of mass violence. So are all mass violence perpetrators mentally ill? Well, again, it depends on the definition of mental illness or impaired mental health. Using a very broad functional criteria, all mass violence perpetrators could be considered mentally ill by definition, but this just becomes not very helpful, right? And again, it's important for us to understand the spectrum of mental health disease, but also recognizing that the majority of individuals with severe and persistent mental illness and with mental illness in general will not go on to perpetuate mass violence and so to advocate for our communities that we serve. So generally speaking, most mass violence perpetrators did not have a major acute psychiatric disorder such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or depression. And among those who did show signs of mental illness, psychopathology alone usually does not provide a, su a sufficient causal explanation. So again, an individual might have a diagnosis of OCD, might have an, a diagnosis of panic disorder, but does that diagnosis in itself lead to the individual perpetuating a mass violent event? Not necessarily. So it's complicated, and we need to make sure that we're advocating for our individuals that we serve. So that's a little bit of a snapshot of thinking about mental illness and its role for mass violence. What I'd like to do is pass it over to my counterpart over here to talk a bit about the role that gun restrictions play in mass violence. All right, well thank you, Sarah. Uh, the issue is, is as you're gonna see, is going to be much more than simply guns. But in looking at uh, the role of guns and the presence of guns in our community and, um, and, and that whole issue, it is, it is very difficult, in fact, it's not possible to generalize and talk about the United States as one entity. Because the United States is very broad, 350 million people, we have, um, a dozen or so population centers in the millions and tens of millions of people. Then we have vast areas of, uh, uh, ur of rural areas, some wilderness area, uh, a lot of suburban areas. So we have very different populations, very different ethnic mixes, and a number of uh, confounding discrepancies that make it very, very difficult to talk about the United States in totality, especially when we're comparing it to countries that really are no bigger than one of our medium-sized states. So, <clears throat> in, when we think about uh, guns and gun control, there's a natural inclination to think about the um, uh, NRA, the National Rifle Association, and uh, one member of the National Rifle, Rifle Association publishes this um, book on the state laws, the variability between states, for members or for the general public to use when they're traveling, because if someone is traveling with a, with a firearm, they need to be cognizant of the laws of the states and the jurisdictions that they're passing through. This includes state laws, but also uh, city ordinances and, and things like that. So in Washington, D.C., you can be arrested for simply having ammunition. You don't even have to have a firearm, per se. Uh, in Wyoming and other places, there's uh, far less in the way of things to be concerned about. But this publication does talk about the, the uniquenesses in uh, all 50 states. Now this is a very interesting chart. This lists all the various states <clears throat> and it roughly groups them by restrictiveness in, uh, in gun control laws. You know, the need to register, uh, whether there's uh, uh, open carry or concealed firearm permit things. The various things that were in this slide in the fine print that I can't really read from here are categorized and each state is clustered around how, how strict are their laws. What you have here on the far uh, left side of the chart <clears throat> 
the first dozen states have uh, the most restrictive kinds of uh, gun control laws and those, those bars show the kind of variance because in, in doing this there's a certain uh, difficulty in just assigning a, a numerical value to how strict is this law. But uh, these states tend to cluster in the far northeast. They include all of southern New England, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, New Jersey, and uh, then California slips in there. But they, for the most part, are largely in the, in the upper northeast part of the country. If we look at the far right-hand side of the slide, you find uh, very low restrictiveness but you find an interesting uh, accumulation of states. You have Vermont as the least restrictive, the most uh, open in terms of uh, firearm possession and, and use in Vermont, and most of northern New England, New Hampshire, Maine, and you have a good number of uh, rural states. You've got Wyoming and New Mexico and Colorado. You have some of the southern states, Mississippi, whatnot. Uh, and these, so now we ask, is there a correlation between mass violence and the relative restrictiveness of gun laws in, the, in those various states? It's tempting to, th to think that there's some kind of relationship there. But here's where the challenge really comes in. This again is a distribution of states. And on the y-axis we have the, uh, we have the, an effort to measure mass violence, the occurrence. So that's the, the level of mass violence is on the um, y-axis. And on the x-axis is the relative restrictiveness or permissiveness of the laws in those states. So what you see up in the far uh, right-hand corner is Vermont. It is uh, high in permissiveness and has high association of kind of gun violence. Now, how many of you would have thought of Vermont as a violent state? Just by show of hands. Okay, so most of you are surprised by this. Well, I'd point out that the surprise is not so much in the reality. The surprise is in a statistical phenomenon that we call the, um, the phenomenon of small numbers. If you look at the the actual measure on the y-axis, we're talking about 0 0.005, 0 0.001, 0 0.02, 0 0.025. These are, these are very small increments that you have to expand in order to get separation. So there's not the kind of difference between the, uh, these outcomes as it would appear graphically just looking at the chart. And, in, and as we saw on the previous slide, oops, the permissiveness is pretty well clustered. Half of the country is very permissive. Another third of the country is pretty darn permissive. And less than about 20% of the country is uh, more restrictive. So those differences are small. And then the differences of the actual amount of violence is small. Because again, we're talking about a small number. Uh, Linda Rosenberg mentioned in her uh, talk this morning that all of the mass violence deaths kind of rounding up out over the last 16 years come to around 500 people. Suicides over that time period is like 300,000. So this is a very, very small phenomenon that you're trying to understand statistically and you run into a lot of statistical challenges, particularly the phenomenon of small numbers. One small shooting in Vermont will send them through the roof because they are the 49th largest state in population. The smallest state population is Wyoming, which is right, um, right on the line there, right below Arizona on the far right-hand side. And the third largest, third smallest state in population is Alaska, which is right down at the bottom with less uh, violence than Massachusetts or Hawaii. So you see the, the difficulty in measuring all of this is in the phenomenon of small numbers and the great disparity and difference between uh, various regions and states in our country.
Now, it's hard to do research when you can't get at the information. <clears throat> and Sarah mentioned the challenge in even agreeing on what constitutes a mass violence event. And this took me by surprise. We met for about three days in Chicago with a panel of experts and uh, had a very interesting time and conversation. And, uh, and we had representatives there from the FBI and law enforcement and all, all the other people that uh, Sarah mentioned. And, and we talked really for like an hour or more around the definition of what constitutes a mass violent event. Uh, and then we talked for another hour about what constitutes whether or not a mental condition is involved. Because intuitively, there's a sense in the public that someone who commits this kind of action is not right. That's not a DSM diagnosis, at least not yet, but might be proposed in DSM-6. Not right and um, not right one and two. But, um, <clears throat> But so we've got problems in definitions and we've got problems in data collection because we don't really know where firearms are. When you start carving up the map, you can find places that have lots of firearms and little violence. You have places with few firearms and lots of violence. You have places with lots of firearms and lots of violence. And sorting through that becomes a, a set of statistical anomalies that can change tomorrow with a single event. So the research and the data collection is challenging. Gun policy <clears throat> is another challenge because there is a reflexive response when something happens. Oh, it's about guns. Oh, it's about mental health and, and back and forth. And in reality, we don't know as much as we would like to know about the role of either of those factors in, in what's happening. But we do have a sense of societal helplessness when suddenly, randomly, a good number of people are killed in a church or in a, uh, a mall or in a, uh, an open outdoor fair or some um, athletic event or something else, so, or a uh, music concert. <clears throat> so, much of the research is inconclusive. The RAND study, which was that reference here? Yes, the RAND study in 2018 did a meta-analysis of all the existing uh, data, and what they concluded was that there could be no conclusion. The, the current information available when it's looked at honestly and rigorously points us to a lot of open questions for which we don't have answers that we can say are based in uh, solid evidence. We have our own kind of instincts, our biases, our opinions, uh, but we don't have data that guides us in one direction or another. And research is challenging because of the data uh, problems, but also because of some reluctance to do research in this area. There's, um, it is a politically hot kind of item and uh, political temperaments guide what the government is going to stick its nose into to do research and, and make investments. So we have challenges in front of us in, in understanding what's going on. Now these are some measures for which there is some evidence. We talk about universal background checks. Again, it's very difficult because what is it we're checking for? We're checking to see if the person is a convicted felon, in which case, in, in uh, most cases, they're not allowed to have guns. Do they have a mental illness, but in what sense? Commitment is also an interesting phenomenon because what many of us think about as commitment is actually temporary detention. When someone is first taken into custody because they're suicidal or they're uh, acting psychotic or whatever, they're not actually being committed. They're being taken into uh, custody in a temporary uh, detention order of some type. And every state has a, a different name for it. It can be a Baker Act in Florida, a 1013 in Georgia, a green warrant uh, somewhere else. And, but those don't become commitments until some period of time has passed and the individual has a right to appear in front of a judge or magistrate and plead their case, at which point then they become committed. So. It's, it's very difficult to decide 
who is it we're talking about re limiting, restricting, and whatnot. Competence testing is uh, something that's been talked about. Although again, w competence in what? In handling the gun itself, the, these people that have perpetrated mass violence don't seem to have needed more training in how to use their gun. Uh, so what is it, what is the competence that we're, we're gonna be uh, testing for? Requiring states to report data to some central repository so that it can become collected and be, un and be analyzed is another piece, but that also sparks a lot, of a lot of strong feelings that what other purposes is the government going to use this kind of collection for? Now the one area that seems to have um, more universal acceptance is what we call the red flag laws. Has, is that a term everyone's familiar with? Okay, uh, it's red flag laws refer to uh, the removal of guns from an individual by the police for a temporary period of time with a pathway to restoration, which may be downstream, it could be a year or whatever. This, these laws came out of Florida after the school shooting there. And uh, I saw on the news, I think it was yesterday or this morning, the tragedy that a second student has committed suicide from uh, that high school out of, we speculate, survivor guilt or some other sequelae from, ha from being part of that event. So it's a, a very great tragedy, but out of that tragedy, uh, Florida did put together a, a red flag law where uh, guns can be taken away from someone who's making threats, acting strange, that has people concerned about them. Now often this can be um, an intimate partner, or a spouse, uh, someone in the family, or someone from school, coach, whatever, but a process by which someone's identified uh, guns are taken, and then there is a process for them to have their uh, uh, guns restored to them after some period of time after they resolve whatever the issues were that, you know, brought them to this. So allowing families to petition for temporary removal of firearms. Um, Connecticut has a similar, um, similar statute. And let me, let me turn this back over to okay. Sarah. I'll take it. So kind of with that too, um, Frank highlighted a bit of the work that's been done with regards to looking at um, gun restrictions and how that may play a role in prevention of mass violence. Um, I wanna talk a bit about the research on threat assessment. And you can see here a list of a lot of um, research on threat assessment, and we're gonna go through each one of them very slowly, painstakingly for the rest of the evening. Just joking. Um, that I'll give that, that's a Joe Parks joke, so we'll give credit where credit is due. Um, but these are available, and if you want more information um, on kind of the makeup of a threat assessment team, um, our colleague, Dr. Jack Rosell, will be presenting um, Wednesday morning, um, so please go and check him out too. Um, but it's important to know, and this is really pertinent to those of us in the mental health space, uh, about the research on threat assessment. Because um, quite often in a threat assessment team, there is a mental health um, expert that plays a role in this team. A lot of the research on threat assessment has been done in the school setting, um, and this is an important note um, to talk about, is that although quite often we're concerned about our youth in the school setting um, from a mass violent event, that actually more mass violence has occurred in restaurants than in school settings. But unfortunately, um, quite often because of the vulnerability of the youth that are there and certainly the heightened tragedy that occurs whenever there's a school setting, we want to put all of our resources into protecting our youth. Um, and that's a very noble effort, but we also want to be very mindful about how sometimes those efforts um, can cause damage as well. Um, that being said, I want to talk about an effort that can be very helpful for youth. Um, and some states have actually adopted um, threat assessment teams in their school-based setting. Um, it's important to note, and you know, quite often in the world of child mental health, we're pulling down work that's been done in the adult population to kids. Um, this is kind of a reverse phenomenon here, that although there's a lot of threat assessment teams in school-based settings, you can have a threat assessment team in larger, larger organizations, um, in kind of adult spaces as well. 
Um, but really an important aspect of a threat assessment team is that the culture is a safe culture. And we can talk about schools that have adopted a threat assessment model for a youth um, that not necessarily has a diagnosis of mental illness, um, but that perhaps behaviorally there's some concerns. And it's important because a lot of times whenever um, somebody is thinking about having this type of mass violence um, in their mind of something they might carry out, quite often there's some leakage around this. Um, especially with youth, they might tell somebody about it. They might allude to the fact that they are um, you know, looking into guns. They might be on the library kind of looking up um, ways to create a bomb or to do something. And if we don't have somebody that can speak up and say something about that behavior, say I'm worried, go to um, a teacher or a counselor or mention something about the youth um, because of their concern, we might miss an opportunity to prevent something from happening. That being said, um, especially in the school setting, if a youth sees something but doesn't feel like it's a safe space to say something, more than likely they won't. And that's really important for us in the mental health space um, that really um, about 99% of threats um, in these threat assessment teams will actually not be carried out. And what we see whenever there's threat assessment teams in the school is that there's actually a reduction in the amount of students that are expelled or arrested or suspended. Um, and we can imagine this too, right? Imagine a youth that's struggling, um, that is perhaps kind of falling into the space of thinking about causing some um, type of destruction or tragedy, um, and then has some problematic behavior. And what often happens to youth with problematic behavior? You can yell it out. I didn't hear it at all. I wish I So suspended, right? Kicked out of school. And that's a missed opportunity to provide some support for them. Right? And so what we notice is whenever these threat assessment teams are happening in the school-based setting, that actually suspension rates decrease. That we actually see racial disparities reduced or absent. That counseling is used more often and there's a more positive school climate. Um, and again, I mentioned Dr. Roselle's um, talk on Wednesday. Um, this can be a real collaborative team that can come together. But it's important to know that in the re um, regards of what, what has been done and what can be done, that there's a lot of research on threat assessment as being a positive way um, to have some support. I think it's really important for us, and I don't know if you guys have seen this, but as a child psychiatrist that does a lot of consultation, um, who's had the opportunity to have um, either been caring for youth or in your own community have had actor shooter, active shooter drills in the school setting? Right? Um, I mean, so that's a lot of us raising our hands. Um, and it's important for us to understand the research on that. As a child psychiatrist, it's something that I am gravely concerned about, active shooter drills um, kind of causing more trauma than actually helping. And so for those of you that work integrally with school settings, it might be helpful to talk with them about the model of threat assessment. Talk with them about the positive school culture and how that can be very helpful and preventative and kind of lead them away from these policies that can actually do more harm than good. When we're looking at prevention um, strategies, it's important to kind of look at a public health model, right? And the public education system is a real, um, I think, easy way to kind of think about this, kind of the universal social and emotional um, help that is there, helping to identify persons of concerns, and this is where I think the National Council's Mental Health First Aid can be very powerful here, right? The kind of notion of seeing something, saying something, being able to identify somebody that might be struggling, um, but then also being able to have selective measures that can be able to assess and intervene a person with specific identified warning signs, right? Talking about this, kind of hoarding weapons, history of domestic violence and interpersonal violence might be of a concern and then some more indicated measures. And we've talked about a bit about kind of removal of guns in a very, um, I would say, legislative way that kind of pro provides for a sense of rights for individuals, but also make sure we kind of get them through that high risk period. Um, it's important that we're looking at this as kind of a tiered approach and not just kind of laying on the, the hands of the mental health experts, but as a community coming together. Um, for policy implications, um, another thing that we often talk about is noting that whenever these events occur, whether it be within the community or within the state, um, whenever they are um, televised, that quite often our youth are struggling whenever something like this happens. And one of our expert panel members does a lot around grieving um, and grief with childhood and also recommended too that um, perhaps providing education for teachers, being able to kind of support youth after an event like this happens could be very helpful. And it's important for us in the mental health space to recognize not only the preventative nature of kind of, um, of these mass casualties, but also the consequences that occur afterwards and how we can be of support to the community.
And also important to know that there has been similar recommendations for this um, through the Sandy Hook Advisory and other supports as well. Um, and certainly those are great um, resources to take a look at about how to support communities. Um, as I mentioned, there have been states that have actually mandated um, threat assessment within their school settings, so there is a precedent. And again, for those of you that are working with school communities, um, this is a, a state model to take a look at. Um, and, and important to kind of highlight the research that's been done, which not only is there kind of a preventative fashion with this, but also the, I'd say, the consequences of reduction in suspensions, kind of greater, greater school community efforts that can be helpful whenever we use a threat assessment team. I'm gonna pass it back over to Frank, who's gonna talk a little bit more um, about um, issues with guns. I didn't, I didn't really know a good segue for that, so that was about it. Right. And, this, and we really are just talking about a couple of pieces in this paper that we struggled with, uh, I think, in a, in a very sober way, uh, because we learned as soon as we jumped in that we had problems in definition and data and all kinds of other things, as well as the political overlays and the emotions and everything else. So this has been really one of the more interesting, interesting is not even the right word, one of the more challenging experiences that I've had in terms of uh, trying to study something and put together uh, a paper or proposals. Now the constitutional issues for uh, at, at present are really fairly well in place. We've had a couple of rulings from the Supreme Court, you know, within the last few decades that continue to reaffirm the Second Amendment as a constitutional right. This is different than a driver's license, uh, and this, this was also somewhat revelatory to me. I work in geriatric psychiatry. In geriatrics, one of the most challenging things that I uh, wish I didn't have to deal with at all is driver's licenses, because the elderly want to continue to drive, but even if they can't drive, they, they want their driver's license. It's kind of a symbol of independence, it's used for identification. Giving that up is, um, I, I don't know really how to describe how serious it is for people. So when it comes down to can so-and-so still drive, and that's the question that comes to me from the facility all the time. You know, I take a deep breath. Now, I practice in Virginia, and Virginia has this ironed out pretty well to where a person can make an anonymous uh, report to the Department of Motor Vehicle, and the Department of Motor Vehicle will simply send a notice to the individual and ask them to come in for a driver's test, and they'll just administer the test and see what happens. Now, you can also disclose who you are. You can tell the individual, you know, I'm going to ask DMV to retest you, or you can do whatever, or you can negotiate something in between where they keep their driver's license but they turn over the keys or sell the car or do whatever. So I was very familiar with this, but the law enforcement people were very quick to pull me back and say, you know, driving is a privilege, but bearing arms is a constitutional right. And it is not so easy to uh, limit or restrict a constitutional right as it is um, a societal privilege. So that was something that I've, I, I continue to think about even now. Uh, the, the Second Amendment, you know, is second of ten amendments, the first ten amendments that we call the Bill of Rights. They were added by uh, James Monroe and, and James Madison to the Constitution after the Constitution was finished because they felt that even with all the effort that went into putting together that structure for this grand experiment, these rights needed to be delineated in a, in a clear and concise way. And the order in which the Ten Amendments flow is in itself an indication of the priority that uh, the founders gave to this. So the constitutionality of this is difficult. This chart is very interesting, this kind of bubble chart. This represents uh, across the years from the top 2013 down to 2018, over the five-year period and across uh, each year, each bubble represents a bill that was proposed in Congress that would have some effect on gun rights. And there was, uh, you know, 300 plus of these bills introduced over this five-year period. How many of them were passed into law? One. <laughs> 
And the one that was passed into law is, is, is very loosely considered a gun control law. It, it basically states that uh, law enforcement officers have a right to carry their, um, their weapon, their, their departmental weapon, when they're off duty or even when they're off duty. So, because there were some localities that didn't want police to have their weapon when they were off duty. So that's the one law that got passed in five years with uh, around 400 laws introduced. So there's a lot of activity around this when something happens, but out of that activity, very little uh, you know, survives. So some possible additional measures <clears throat> for you know, high-risk far, um, firearm owners. We talk about the threat assessment and management that um, Sarah alluded to, and I really would encourage you to read the paper because there's much more actually written around this whole threat assessment. It's a huge topic. Uh, it's really based somewhat off of the FBI and CIA doing threat assessment on a more national level for big, big kind of events. Uh, the, affirmative, the affirmative removal uh, after some disqualifying event. So basically when someone has raised a concern to their family or, or others. And then uh, enhanced investigation and enforcement around intimate uh, partner violence. This is really a big issue. There was one case in particular that was uh, very troubling to, to read about where the individual murdered his girlfriend, or I'm not sure if they were actually married, after a, you know, a restraining order and all kinds of back and forth. When the police went to find him, he was already in jail. He'd already been arrested for some other violent act, like within 24 hours of killing um, you know, his intimate partner. So <clears throat> there's a lot of violence that is domestic. You're, you're more likely to be, you're most likely to be killed by someone who loves you. That's what it kind of boils down to, one of the ironies of life. Uh, and we talk about restriction of private transfer. This is basically a lot of guns float around, basically. Some guns can be sold at shows, there's little tracking, and people can sell or give away guns as presents and whatnot, so uh, very difficult to, to collect. So this is just a list that I'll leave with you to look at as some considerations. We did make some recommendations at the end of the paper. We won't go through all those today. But um, these, are the, these are two that kind of fall out as important. <clears throat> Domestic violence restraining orders, focusing more on people that have identified themselves as having a hard time and moving towards a violent state of mind, and then these extreme uh, risk protection orders that would uh, include some gun removal. And so broad, you know, other considerations are, that have some considerations around any kind of proposal that you might think about, let's put it that way. For something to really survive, it's gonna have to have broad popular support. It, this cannot be a 51-49 uh, vote. It's got to be based on some kind of evidence and some sort of scientific backing that that not only makes the argument for doing it, but also gives us some reason to believe that it will have an effect and an ability to measure that effect downstream. We talk about voluntary versus uh, involuntary kinds of things. Those things that can be voluntary certainly are gonna be easier to have consist consensus around, but may not be as effective. Uh, abridging civil liberties, uh, we've talked about. Uh, temporary versus permanent is important. Things. For things to be effective, they've got to be low cost and clearly defined. Um, I think that goes without saying. And to promote positive behavior, this is really a struggle because within our panelists, our expert members, this kind of discussion drifts towards utopian speculation very easily. The idea that if we could refine all of society so that if everyone felt better and loved each other more than we wouldn't have violence. Well, that's interesting, but gets very far downstream and is not helpful. Uh, the, the counter to all this is to simply stay in our lane and recognize that these are small 
frequency events, it's not clear even from the evidence whether they're actually increasing or whether the perception of them is increasing uh, because of the, the dramatic nature of them. Other things that are clearly increasing, like the opioid uh, fatality rates for overdose, those things are compelling. 72,000 lost last year. We only lost 50, I say only, we lost 54,000 soldiers in Vietnam over the whole 11 years. So as I grew up, I watched this body count for most of my adolescence, right up until I had my own draft card and number. Only 54,000 compared to 72,000 last year, and 64,000 the year before that, and some 50,000 before that. We have lost over three times the amount of deaths to opioids that we lost in the entire Vietnam War over 11 years, to put it in perspective. Gun mass violence becomes a trivial statistic in comparison to those numbers that we're familiar with. It's not to minimize the shock and the, and the awfulness of those events and the desire to not make them happen, but the difficulty and the challenge is in the very nature of the small frequency and the randomness in which they seem to occur. Hindsight seems to be really very close to perfect. Um, when we look back on something, it's very obvious often that someone was giving off signs, we were kind of seeing them but minimizing them or maybe not seeing them. Sue Klebold, the mother of one of the Columbine shooters, was on our panel and she shared quite candidly and does this, has written books and speaks on this all the time, so this is no um, confidence violation here. She's, she speaks uh, very clearly about her own surprise in learning about her son because uh, a week or two before the Columbine incident, he'd gone to his prom, had a girlfriend, had applied to a number of colleges, was accepted to some, was, in, was looking forward to his future. He had all the things going for him that we, if you did a suicide risk assessment or something else, you'd say, well, he's future oriented, he's got relationships, I mean, where's this coming from? In hindsight, when she went through his, um, his journal, his diary, he had in fact engaged in some self-mutilation, some cutting. He had, he had written about uh, depression, struggling with uh, depression and things. But these weren't, this wasn't like the weight of his whole journal. These were references here and there that she just kind of picked up. And so she says, w would she do things differently? Yes, she would ask different kinds of questions at different frequencies with more, um, seriousness and concern, but that's after the fact. Going forward, in the case I mentioned about the, the woman whose uh, intimate partner killed her, the police get complaints on a daily basis about um, partner struggles. They, they struggle with how to evaluate which one of these is potentially going to go very bad versus which one is going to reconcile itself. And they, they would be glad if we could provide them a tool that would do that. I don't know if how many of your centers want to sign up for that, but I'm sure your sheriff would, um, would appreciate it. So the common elements, this is, you know, uh, again, review, talking about those red flag laws that I think have a, a large consensus. They seem to be implementable. They seem to be low cost. They seem to protect... Um, your civil liberties, if there's a restorative process, um, and seem to have acceptance even by uh, people within the NRA and other organizations that uh, uh, guard over the uh, Second Amendment. So we're back at looking at these uh, states, and here are a number of states that have enacted some form of red flag law, and of course, Connecticut, Florida, a real hot spots, Vermont, uh, interestingly, and then the West Coast have already enacted this, and then it's proposed in a number of other states. I'm not sure how the color coding goes. I think what's blue is purple in the proposed area. So, um, Know your target and what's behind it before pulling the trigger. This is really a, um, 
an admonition that we not be impulsive in what we do, that we think through this for, for a number of reasons. For one thing, the, the lift is so heavy in, in moving forward to do something here that what you do and what you accomplish needs to be the best that it can be and needs to be able to work. Because to put a lot of effort into something and then it doesn't have a, a measurable effect or some, some convincing uh, outcome can be discouraging and can be counterproductive. So there's an emphasis there and our expert panelists emphasize that we should be strategic and be focused on our mark and define the terms and be very clear about what's proposed and how it's going to go forward. So we, we do have some time for questions and some back and forth. Um, I'll, I'll say just in closing a little bit about bias. Bias is something that all of us have all the time about everything. Uh, there is no way of getting around it. The only thing you can do is put it on the table in front of you, look at it, and say, okay, how can I best put that aside to allow me to move forward objectively? Um, and this is an area in which case there's strong biases in all directions. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, I'm Hank Schwartz. I served on the Sandy Hook Advisory Commission. Um, I want to go back to a, an early slide of yours, um, the slide that highlights that uh, mental illness contributes about 4%, um, but that if you look at a subgroup of young men who are associates uh, po of poverty and, and uh, you know, et cetera, there is a, a subgroup. Uh, I think you left out one important element which the Sandy Hook Commission included in our analogous slide, and that is the duration of untreated illness, or DUI. So that, and I, I hope that you'll add that before that your final report is, is published. That DUI is approximately 18 months in the United States between the first onset of a symptom and the time that somebody may actually um, come to attention. And in combination with those other factors, it does create a subset of mentally ill individuals who are at notably higher risk. I, I, I completely agree, and I think that's part of the challenge too, right? When we look at the research is that there might be individuals that had undiagnosed mental illness, um, and there certainly are a complexity of factors. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. I agree. Yep, that, is, that is duly noted, and I would add, add to that that this undiagnosed you know, period of time is, is clearly seen in retrospect. How to see it prospectively is a real challenge, but it's, it's obviously uh, duly noted. Appreciate that. Um, two, two quick questions. In, in the previous slide, you used an abbreviation MSEs. I wasn't sure what that meant. And the second question is, when will your report, be, will your report become available to the public and how can the public get a hold of it? Yes, so um, we were, all, so MA MSD stands for mass shooting events, and it was really kind of highlighting that um, if we're targeting that, it's such a small number, um, so, so that's the definition. And then um, by April or May is when we should have the manuscript ready, um, so that is our intention for it to be distributed. Um, so I'm not the, the best person to speak to this, but I saw a survivor of the Virginia Tech shooting speak earlier this month. And she talked about her struggle to be accepted as a victim, even though she had non-physical injuries. So I just kind of wanted to make that point for those people who've um, been victimized by the shootings but don't really show up in the numbers um, when we're comparing how many people are affected. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point, and I absolutely agree. And I think we tried to talk about that, too. I think that's the reason why the National Council um, wanted to bring this to everyone's attention, um, is because in addition to the, the physical injuries, the, the, the casualties, um, that those that are intimately involved are affected. But I, but I, would, I would argue that all of us are. Um, and kind of knowing about vicarious traumatization and certainly for someone that's worked with youth and how we're proposing interventions that are a reaction to it, I think it's something that um, there's kind of um, a ripple effect about how it is, um, is causing difficulties and certainly concerns for PTSD and other, other aspects of our lives. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Hi, thank you. I was glad to see that there was a, a reference, of course, in, included in the information and the data around domestic violence and those that are subject to a court order. Um, I would actually um, encourage to expand upon that a little bit more um, broadly look into um, the, the Violence Against Women Act and in particular domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault and stalking. Um, and in particular stalking um, which pre almost always um, precedes a domestic violence act. Um, it's a great predictor of future violence and um, hugely correlated in the research with, uh, with uh, violence, additional violence. That, that comment reminds me of one of the things we struggled with was in what was the scope of our mission? Because in taking on, in taking on such a topic, we inevitably get drawn into all kinds of violence. And so domestic violence and what you, you mentioned is absolutely true and something we'd like to be able to speak to but was a little bit out of scope but it also reminds me of other kinds of loss like uh, just gun homicide, particularly amongst uh, you know, males under 30 years old, uh, specifically among um, males of color under um, age 30. And, and so some of the things that are highly correlated to those kinds of risks are poverty and high concentration of population. So when you combine not just poverty alone, but when you combine poverty with close living spaces or high urbanized areas, um, you have a real explosive situation. If you look at just like five neighborhoods within Chicago, that identifies some 80, 90 percent of all the violence going on in a small subset. You can look at places that are poor, like you know West Virginia, high, very high rural, not so much actual violence though. So if people have a place to spread out, they somehow become uh, easier to get along with. But if they are poor and closely packed. It, what, what I might add too is I think it's also in the, the construct of being able to research this and that a lot of, a lot of kind of um, aggregating data will exclude mass, mass casualties that were due to domestic violence because we do know there have been incidences where mass violence has been um, kind of part and parcel to a domestic violence event, um, whether that be, um, you know, somebody who was injured or, you know, a casualty that occurred that then it kind of extended out to the community that that individual worked with. Um, so I think you bring up a really good point. Um, and I think it's something that, that, as Frank mentioned, we grappled with as well is how are we defining this? Um, and in the way that we define it kind of um, leads to the way we research it and kind of leads us to, to varying conclusions. But it's an excellent point. And the, the way the FBI is defining it, which took me back a little bit, is really on fatalities. You have to have a body count that hits four or three by a certain scale. If the person is ineffective and severely wounds 20 people, mm -hmm. but no one dies, it doesn't count. Yeah. And that's just part of the problem of data collection and defining terms. Uh, because in the domestic situation you're talking about, there are examples of someone who kills the spouse, all their children, goes and kills the in-laws, and then kills himself. Okay, the body count is there, it's a mass event. If he wounds everybody, didn't happen. I think we probably have time for one yep. more question. Frank and I will stay afterwards, but we wanna be mindful of everybody's time. Um, go ahead. Um, hi, my name's um, Stephanie Bonnie. I'm a trauma surgeon in Newark, uh, New Jersey. And um, to the point um, that was made earlier about um, vicarious trauma, I just want to um, point out not to forget the doctors in this, because yeah. I can tell you that my trauma meetings, like this is what we're talking about in the hallway, yeah. is um, rallying around all the physicians who've been there um, at Las Vegas and Sutherland Springs and all these other places when these mass um, uh, you know, victims come in. But I also find that, um, this is more of a comment than a question, but I, I, I work in both the gun violence research space and in violence intervention spaces, and I find that there's a lot of conflating between the root cause and the vector, um, the vector being the firearm and the root cause being the, the domestic violence or the, the, the psychiatric problems or the ACEs or whatever it is that's um, social determinants that are causing violence. And I think that that's one thing that we can really work on is defining that, because I find a hard time, like with, for example, advocacy, 
in my state where you know the the lawmakers feel like uh, a hospital-based violence intervention program or cure violence is is gun violence prevention, mm -hmm. and then they completely ignore suicide mm -hmm. and all the and so there's this Venn diagram there that I think is really unexplored and gets conflated too much. Um, and so I just I, I'm interested in your thoughts on that, and then you know it was more of a comment. I, I've got you, you, it reminds me of one thing in particular that I meant to mention earlier is that. There is evidence that the United States is actually becoming less violent as a whole. And I personally am more at risk of being assaulted or beaten up in France than I am in the United States. But if I get into a struggle in the United States, I'm more likely to be killed. So we are, we are actually less violent than most of our Western European uh, friends but when we get violent, we become more lethal. So we put up with a lot, and then we finish it. Uh, and that was a, kind of an interesting finding. But overall, our, our society has been becoming uh, less and less uh, violent. But at the same time, these other incidences are more and more shocking. But, and I think to your first point as well, um, I mean, I think that we're learning more and more about vicarious traumatization, and I'm sure that you all know this as well, is that not necessarily being exposed to it, but just even exposed to the material um, can really affect us personally and professionally, and I would absolutely agree with you. And again, I think this is the space of mental health kind of advocating for um, understanding how this can affect us as a community can be really important. Um, and I agree, I think there's, there's so much overlap and it's a very complicated, complex issue when we think about violence and the overlay between um, uh, weapons and mental illness and, and all these factors. We need to continue to talk about it and have some parameters about how we're discussing it. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, thank you guys so much for your time. We'll stay up here for a little bit um, and you guys have a great evening. Thank you.